Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Global Read. Uh, today, our November gold, uh, sorry for that, I'm thinking golden, and it is, it will be a golden presentation, uh, but our Global Read is on com uh, Compassionomics. And so we are really thrilled to have one part of the authorship of Compassionomics with us, Stephen Tresniak. Anthony Mazzarelli is the co-author of the book. Um, and today it will be with the generous contributions of many people who are part of the Charter for Compassion family who have given generously so that we can continue to have these monthly global reads. I am now going to turn over the global read to one of our board of trustees folks, Charlie Barker, Dr. Charlie Barker. Um, who will be the facilitator for today's presentation. And Charlie is one of those people who has been with the charter almost from the very beginning. He's the founder of Compassionate um, Dallas Fort Worth. He's been our board chair, and now he is the chairperson of our internal affairs committee. And being a physician himself, he was the obvious person to ask if he would be the facilitator for today's presentation. So Charlie, I'll turn this over to you so that you can introduce Stephen. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Marilyn. Uh, it really gives me great pleasure to uh, host uh, today's Global Read uh, with um, uh, Steve Treziak, uh, the co-author, along with um, uh, Anthony Mazzarelli on in the book uh, Compassionomics. Uh, this book came out in 2019. And uh, when I got wind of it, that it was uh, published, I immediately bought the book and read it from front to back almost at uh, not exactly one sitting, but almost one sitting. Uh, very fascinating, very interesting, extremely informative. And for someone in the healthcare arena, as we both are, um, it, uh, it has been uh, an eye opener, a confirmer of what we know is a crisis within the healthcare system. Uh, so again, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Stephen Treziak. As I said, I, my first encounter was in 2019. I immediately emailed, I called, uh, Steve and I uh, connected. And we talked and uh, I immediately said, you, you have to be more connected to the Charter for Compassion. He said, yes, I want to be. So he is now uh, a member of our Global Compassion Council, has been for the last couple of years. Um, Steve graduated just a little bit about his uh, background before, we, before I turn it over to him. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a Navy guy. Um, and so I'm sure that he's gloating uh, about Notre Dame's win this past Saturday uh, over Navy. Um, I'll give you that one, Steve. Um, okay, Steve, Steve earned uh, his medical degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his master's of public health degree at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He completed his residency training at the University of Illinois at Chicago and his fellowship in critical care medicine at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. He's board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, emergency medicine, and neurocritical care. Um, a lot of publications, primarily around uh, the field of resuscitation science, which is to be expected, but most recently uh, around the value of compassion and how it uh, applies within the medical arena. And so with this, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. And we're just uh, excited to have you here today to tell us about your book uh, and the way to and the hope of the future. So please. Charlie, thank you so much. It is an honor to be with you all today. I want to thank you, Charlie. I want to thank Marilyn and Mimi and colleagues for putting this together and making it possible. It's really a um, an honor to join you. And um, over the next um, maybe 20 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work 
that my colleague Anthony Mazzarelli and I have been doing uh, in what we call Compassionomics, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. And then I'd love to do, um, Charlie, we could have a conversation. Uh, and if people want to put questions in the chat uh, box, that would be great if anybody in the group um, ha has questions that they want to ask. <clears throat> As Charlie mentioned, I am a physician and Compassionomics is written, um, it's written for everyone, but in large part, it focuses on, on healthcare. We're currently working on a project uh, that really extends Compassionomics to everyone, but it, it is a healthcare book, but the principles run deep and the principles I think um, are widely applicable and can be extrapolated to all the caring professions uh, and beyond. And so again, it's just an honor to be here today, and um, I'm, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very grateful uh, to be with you and and to share with you what we've been working on. And so the first thing that I have for you all uh, today is an ask, an ask. And so my ask of you is this: I, I'm asking you to join me in thinking about something familiar to you, and that's compassion in perhaps an unfamiliar way. And what I mean by that is I'd like to examine compassion, not through a moral ethical lens or through an emotional sentimental lens, but rather through the lens of science. And that may be unconventional in some ways, but I'm sharing with you today work that uh, Anthony Mazzarelli and I did over two years, curating all of the scientific evidence that compassion matters, not just in meaningful ways, but also in measurable ways. So um, just a minute about me. Uh, so I'm an intensivist, I'm an ICU specialist. And um, let me assure you that over the last two years, that's been a pretty interesting job. And um, I'm also a research nerd. Uh, so I spent the first 20 years of my life uh, in, in my, my career uh, doing resuscitation research in the ICU. So cardiac arrest research. My colleagues and I were studying uh, the um, optimal level of oxygen in the blood to, to reduce the risk of permanent brain damage after resuscitation from cardiac arrest. And now I study the science of compassion. And that may be um, a pivot, if you will. Um, I, it certainly was. And, and at the time, I was not in any, uh, I was not in the market for any sort of a pivot or change in trajectory. Um, not at all. We were actually um, getting our research published in good journals and getting uh, research grants from the NIH to support our work. But then one day, one evening, an unexpected question from a 12 year old turned everything upside down and literally made me change the trajectory of my life's work. And that 12 year old was my son. And one day he asked for me for help. He said, dad, I know you give a lot of talks in your job. I have to give a talk for my class at school. Can you help me prepare mine? And I thought this is going to be so awesome. What an amazing father son bonding opportunity. And little did I know what was in store for me. So I said, um, sure, what you got? And he reached out into his backpack and he pulled out a sheet of paper and he put it down on my desk. And on that sheet of paper was the topic for his talk to his classmates. And the topic was this. It was a question. What is the most pressing problem of our time? Seventh grade. Now, I don't know what you all were doing in seventh grade, but I was not doing what is the most pressing problem of our time, not by a long shot. I was a little taken aback, but we worked through it. And in that process, uh, I realized, first of all, there's no such thing. There's no one single most pressing problem of our time. It all has to do with your lens of experience in your corner of the world. So for my son, it was his lens of experience as, as a young person. But for me, it was as a physician leader in my organization, I'm the, I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine here at Cooper Medical School of Rowan University in Camden, New Jersey. And, and I'm an intensivist at Cooper University Healthcare also in Camden, New Jersey. And through my lens of experience, um, what is the most pressing problem of our time? 
in my corner of the world and I had to find it. And um, what, what's not important is, is what he happened to pick, but what, what is important is that he believed it. So that not only the talk he would give is, is something his classmates would find compelling, but he would too. And it set off a great period of introspection for me, um, an existential crisis, if you will. And I looked all around me. I had to find the most pressing problem of our time. And, and, and I'm not old, um, but I'm too old to work on anything except the things that matter the most. And I knew right then and there, I had to start, I had to find the most pressing problem of our time for me. And um, what I found, uh, and, and actually, before I tell you what that was, I'll tell you a story. So on, on uh, October 22nd, 2007, on a snowy stretch of highway outside of Uppsala, Sweden, two buses collided head on. And the wreckage was so severe, one bus literally sheared the other bus in half along the long axis. Six people died, but miraculously, 56 people were saved. And five years later, researchers asked a question, what do survivors remember? And using a rigorous qualitative me research methodology, what they found is the thing that people remembered the most was a lack of compassion from the caregivers at the hospital. And what's really striking is when you read this research, you realize that they were taken to multiple different trauma centers, but they all had the same experience. And these data began to open my eyes to a stark reality. In healthcare, we are in the midst of a compassion crisis, a compassion crisis. And there are a lot of data to support that. Now, you first of all, you may say that, well, maybe we're in the midst of a compassion crisis in society in general. And there's a ton of evidence behind that. For example, a University of Michigan meta-analysis found that over the last 20 years, empathy among college-age students has been declining over time, and the speed of that decline is actually accelerating. A Harvard Graduate School of Education study of 10,000 middle school and high school students in the U.S. found that 80% of the kids believe that their parents, their parents believed uh, or valued their achievements and their accolades more than their kindness for others. And in a striking Pew Research study from just a few years ago, one, fully one third of Americans uh, uh, believe or endorse that they didn't consider compassion for others to be among their core values. But what about healthcare? Healthcare is supposed to be different. Well, research shows that physicians miss 60 to 90% of opportunities to, to um, respond to. Uh, patients with compassion, that compri compassion comprises less than 1% of all physician statements to patients in the context of an office visit. Research from the Mayo Clinic uh, finds that in, the, in an office visit, when a patient is trying to uh, tell you the main reason for coming to the doctor, they're on, on average interrupted in just 13 seconds when research shows that all they need is 26 seconds on average to state their major, major reason for coming to the doctor. And in my domain, um, critical care, perhaps the most striking data that fully one third of end of life conversations in the ICU have no statement of compassion from the care team to the patients of their families. And based on all of these data and more, uh, I conclude we have a compassion crisis indeed. But here's the big question, Charlie. <clears throat> the big question that, that I believe you and I have discussed before, and it's really sort of the the central question of the book. Does compassion really matter? Now, since I'm uh, uh, having the opportunity to be on, uh, on this uh, global read with the Charter for Compassion, I would think that you all think it's pretty important. But, <clears throat> uh, and that's sort of intuitive, and it's always been the cornerstone of the art of medicine. Compassion has always been that. But is compassion just in the art of medicine? Or are there also evidence-based effects belonging in the science of medicine? And what's the evidence? So that's what Anthony Mazzarelli and I did. We did a, um, an approach called systematic review to curate all of the evidence around this question, does compassion really matter? 
and we looked at more than 1,000 scientific abstracts, uh, over 280 original science research papers are embedded in the book, Compassionomics, and we call it Compassionomics because we consider it to be the convergence of the science and the art of medicine, much like genomics or proteomics or other elements uh, of medicine um, uh, that, that use that terminology. And so we went through all of this evidence and we, we, we were really testing a hypothesis because we're research nerds. And we were testing the hypothesis that compassion matters for patients, for patient care, and for those who care for patients, so our healthcare providers. And, in, in the, and I'll speak about that last, it's, it's really the, the resistance to burnout and actually how compassionate connections can promote resilience and resistance to burnout. And so um, we uh, went through all of this evidence and, and we really put it through into four different categories, so to speak. Uh, we found 24 different mechanisms of action by which compassion can have measurable impacts on patients. And we grouped them into physiological effects, psychological effects, effects on patient self-care, as well as um, uh, effects on the quality of care. And um, what we there were a hundred different um, uh, papers uh, to speak on effects uh, effects for patients, and of course we don't have time today to summarize a hundred papers. But what I can do just really quickly is give you sort of a, a summary in physiological effects. There's evidence that compassion for patients can mediate stress mediated disease. It can modulate a patient's experience of pain. I, it, it can't eliminate pain because compassion doesn't do that. But a number of experimental studies show that the touch of a trusted other can modulate and reduce, uh, attenuate, if you will, a, a patient's experience of pain or anyone's experience of pain for that matter. Um, there's evidence that there are immune system effects <clears throat> as well as um, uh, effects for patients with, uh, that suffer from diabetes. The psychological effects may be intuitive to you that, that compassion for patients is a cornerstone of the therapeutic relationship between therapist um, uh, and patient or psychologist and patient, as well as um, uh, quality of care uh, effects. So research has shown that in healthcare environments where there is less caring, patients are less safe because healthcare providers are more prone to making major medical errors. Now, of course, that research points to an association, an association. We shouldn't infer causation from that, but the causal pathway is not too hard to imagine. The research shows that there's a three to five times higher odds of making a major medical error over 90 days if healthcare providers are suffering from depersonalization, one of the cornerstones of the burnout syndrome, which is depersonalization is an inability to make a personal connection. So that's not the opposite of compassion, but where there's depersonalization, there can be no compassion. And if your experience has been like mine with colleagues that you've had before in the past, you've encountered people who just don't seem to care very much. And if you've seen what I've seen, oftentimes they're also somewhat sloppy about the work that they do. And, and there's evidence of this in the healthcare domain. And then lastly, a very powerful um, way in which compassion affects patients is in patient self-care. So if you care deeply for patients and they know that and they feel that, research shows that they're more likely to take their medicine. They're more likely to follow um, a prescribed treatment regimen and follow uh, a physician's advice or a nurse's advice. And <clears throat> non-adherence to medical care in the United States, by the way, has been estimated at around $200 billion in avoidable downstream healthcare costs, as Charlie knows, since he's also uh, a physician. Um, but I'm reminded of a study, I'll share with you a, a very specific study. Um, researchers from Johns Hopkins uh, did a study in 1,700 patients with HIV. Now, HIV is, is a very serious condition, but in 2021, it's also very controllable. The key is always taking your antiretroviral medication without fail and never missing a dose. And so what these Johns Hopkins investigators did in, in uh, 1,700 patients with HIV is they measured everything that they knew to be associated with, with adherence or non-adherence to prescribed therapy of antiretrovirals. And then they asked 
patients one question. And the question was this, does your HIV provider know you as a person? Know you as a person? And what they'd found after adjusting for all these other factors that were associated with adherence or non-adherence, they found that knowing the patient as a person was independently associated with a 33% higher odds of adherence to antiretroviral therapy. But that's not all. It was also associated with a 20% higher odds of having no detectable virus in the blood. So there's a powerful association there. And that study design didn't test causation, but the causal pathway wouldn't be hard to imagine. Patient feels known as a person, patient trusts the doctor. They have something called self-efficacy, meaning they believe that their disease can in fact be controlled. They're more likely to take care, take their medicine and the virus is cleared from the blood to a level at which it's undetectable. A powerful, uh, a powerful uh, set of data to speak to the power of human connection. Now, um, I've told you about the why, why compassion matters. And although I'm sure that's been intuitive to many of you, um, to our knowledge, prior to writing Compassionomics, all that data on the power of compassion in measurable ways um, hadn't been curated before. So that's why we did it. So that's the why, but what about the how? And how is it that we get better uh, at, uh, at compassion for patients in the healthcare domain? or get better at compassion in our daily life, just in the broad sense. And there are really three things. Uh, I don't believe in checklists or in anything like that as it, as it comes to human connection, because people find ways to connect in, in their own way. But there are three important things for mindset, the compassion mindset. Number one is realizing that compassion is in the domain of evidence-based medicine. When you realize that as a physician, it's not just, you realize it's not just a nice to have, but it's actually an evidence-based medicine, you feel differently about the compassion that you hold and that you can um, use in your care of patients every day. When you feel differently about it, you, you recognize it's more powerful than you had previously realized and um, you wanna use it every chance that you get. Uh, next is um, all about, uh, well, it's the recognition that change is possible change is possible. See, I didn't know that. I used to think that people were either wired for compassion or they were not. Like it's in the DNA or the fabric of who you are, but research actually shows quite clearly both in healthcare and outside of healthcare, that compassionate behaviors can in fact be learned. As long as you have a growth mindset and you believe that you can in fact get better, the research supports that it is indeed possible. And so the, you know, I'm not touchy feely. I'm not like that from certain healthcare providers. That just doesn't hold up. Uh, uh, it doesn't um, align with the available science. So change is possible. And lastly, is all about time. Uh, 56, that was the number that was the most striking part of all the research that we've done in Compassionomics. 56% of physicians in one paper published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine found um, or that 56% of physicians thought they didn't have time for compassion, didn't have time for compassion. But it begs the question, how much, how much time does it actually take? And, and we uh, curated the available evidence and found that a meaningful compassion connection in research papers, and there are six of them, it was always 60 seconds or less. And um, when you recognize that, when you realize that it doesn't take as much time as you think, there's sort of a... Um, uh, how, how can it be that, that so many people think that compassion takes so long? And, and there was a, a pivotal study, in my opinion, from the University of Pennsylvania uh, years ago that randomized uh, subjects to four different uses of time. And then they measured something called time affluence. Time affluence is the feeling that you have plenty of time, that you're not in a hurry. And um, as opposed to time famine, meaning you feel like you're behind, you're always late. And they found that of the four different uses of time, it was spending time on yourself, spending time uh, or getting an unexpected windfall of free time, spending, uh, wasting time, or lastly, spending time helping other people. They found that only one use of time actually increased one's feeling of time affluency and feeling like you actually have more time to share. And that was spending time helping other people. So the research supports that there is something about spending time helping other people that makes you feel differently about the time that you have. 
And so the three components of the compassion mindset, evidence-based medicine, uh, change is possible, and it's all about time. And, and one of my colleagues bristles at this discussion about time because he, he always says to me, uh, it should have no time dimension at all. You can go through your day with brusque efficiency, letting everybody know exactly how busy you are, or you can treat people with compassion. And if somebody held a stopwatch to you, it actually wouldn't take any more time. So lastly, um, before we um, uh, I send it back to Charlie so we can just have some uh, dialogue and, uh, and again, feel free to put your questions in there. I, I wanna talk about effects not on patients or patient care, but for those who care for patients or healthcare providers. So <clears throat> that's all about burnout. And I just wanna acknowledge something loud and clear. Um, although burnout has been studied in healthcare providers and specifically physicians, perhaps more than any other um, profession, I, I just want to be clear, you don't have to be a healthcare provider to feel burned out, especially in 2021. And so although a lot of that data comes from the healthcare field, this is not a healthcare thing, this is a human thing. And I'm sure many of the people on this conference today are feeling really burned out because of where we're at uh, in the pandemic. And, um, uh, and so I hope that this data is useful to you as well. So um, this is really where the science meets the personal for me, where the science meets the personal, because after 20 years of working in the ICU and in the ICU, we literally meet people and their, their patients and their families on the worst day of their life. And we do that routinely. And after 20 years of doing that, I came to the stark realization that I had every symptom of burnout myself. So what was I supposed to do? Well, I'm a research nerd. So I went to the, I went to the medical literature and I searched it. And um, what I was finding just didn't compute for me. Uh, what, what, what I, what, it just didn't compute. The research was telling me <clears throat> things that I considered to be escapism, like go on more vacations, go take some nature hikes by yourself, um, detach, pull back. The reason why that didn't compute for me, <clears throat> because it sort of um, is supporting the notion that if I just got away from patients as much as possible, everything would be great. But I believe something had to fundamentally change at the point of care. And this is when we started going through our work on compassionomics. And I became aware of a robust, um, uh, of robust data uh, that support that compassion is beneficial, is a powerful beneficial therapy for the giver too, for the giver too. And what I was taught in medical school was different. So this was the early nineties. And I remember being taught, don't care too much because too much caring burns you out. And I don't know if Charlie was taught that back in his training, but I believed that for 25 years. Of course, it wasn't part of the overt curriculum. It was something that's in what we call the hidden curriculum in medicine that you learn through socialization from your, uh, from your superiors, uh, from the people who are training you. But <clears throat> when we went through the evidence in, in compassionomics, what we found is a different signal. It, the too much caring will burn you out doesn't hold up. You actually do see an association between compassion and burnout, but it's inverse, inverse. So what I was, if what I was taught in medical school was true, high compassion, high burnout, low compassion, low burnout, that would be the association. But what you see in the, in the scientific evidence is inverse, high compassion, low burnout, low compassion, high burnout. It's inverse. So what could explain it? The short answer is no one's no, no one's, uh, uh, absolutely sure. But my hypothesis is this. It's because if you have compassion for patients and their families, and you connect with compassion, you get a relationship that flows from that, that is the fulfilling part of what it means to take care of patients. You get the fulfilling part. If you don't, 
then all you have is a really stressful job. And so the research supports that the people who don't have compassion are actually at the highest risk for burnout under the same amount of stress. And both in healthcare and outside of healthcare, the research supports that the key to resilience, resilience and resistance to burnout is relationships. And so becoming aware of all of this evidence that compassion can be a powerful beneficial therapy for the giver too, I decided to in, in treating my own burnout, I was going to test the compassion hypothesis. So I call it my N of one experiment, N of one. Uh, N is the designation for how many study subjects are in a, in, in a uh, research study. So the N of one, the one study subject was me. I was the only study subject. And I just tested the compassion hypothesis for myself. And I decided uh, very intentionally, uh, I might add, because that's important, that I was going to connect more, not less, uh, pull back, uh, lean in rather than pull back or escape, um, have more meaningful talks with patients and their families, um, care more, not less, more compassion, not less. And that's not just with patients and their families in the ICU, but with my colleagues, with the nurses that I've been working with for the last 20 years, with my colleagues, the other ICU doctors. And, and in doing that, that is when the fog of burnout began to lift for me, changed everything. And so in closing, um, well, first of all, I, I just want to acknowledge the question I asked, does compassion really matter? 100 scientific abstracts, or I said 1,000 scientific abstracts, 280 original science research papers, and a life-changing N of one experiment behind me, I conclude with confidence compassion matters. Um, and that's why we call it compassionomics, a convergence of the science and the art of medicine. But in closing, I want to encourage anybody on this Zoom today, if you're going through burnout right now, um, number one, that's understandable. Okay. Don't be ashamed of it. Uh, um, it's, uh, I would consider it to be normal given what we've been through in the last year and a half. Um, but if you're going through burnout today, Test the compassion hypothesis for yourself. So find that one minute or 40 seconds actually is it, it was the precise timing uh, of one of the most notable studies that it saying it only takes 40 seconds to make a compassion connection and look around for the people around you that might be in need of your 40 seconds of compassion and, and give it to them and, and do it every chance that you get and see how it transforms your experience and affects your burnout. Um, but here's the key. Don't do it because I said so. Do it because science says so. Because that's what the scientific evidence supports. And um, I just want to thank Marilyn and Mimi and, and Charlie and everybody for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I hope you guys have some questions for me. Uh, knowing Charlie like I do, I bet he's got some questions that he wants to ask as well. But um, I'd be happy to Charlie, back to you. Um, I just want to thank you again for the honor of being with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, what a rich uh, talk and so many questions. Uh, certainly those in the healthcare arena have, have the kind of questions. What struck me when I read the book and really pondered and reflected, um, I think that your hypothesis doesn't matter, was uh, very compelling with the evidence that you presented. Um, that it can be learned, um, and we have lots of evidence that, that shows that the neuroplasticity of our brains and the neurogenesis of our brains is such that we can truly learn how to be more compassionate. The real hooker con conclusion that I would like for you to make a comment about before we go to some of the other questions that our uh, participants have is uh, the last conclusion is, but you got to want it. Uh, it matters. <laughs> it matters. You can learn it, but you got to want it. And there's a lot of pushback out there. Well, it's too soft. It's uh, people will run over you. You'll be a doormat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So would you make uh, maybe some comments about, about that? Sure. Um, the, uh, regarding the uh, you got to want it um, statement. So there's science behind that as well. So 
<clears throat> Many of you may be familiar with the research that Dr. Carol Dweck and colleagues at Stanford University have done regarding mindset and specifically growth mindset. So growth mindset is this idea that um, whatever's in front of you, whatever challenge it is, it's just a set of skills you need to master rather than a trait. Like, so when she, they, she studied uh, uh, kids in school and specifically um, their, uh, perf their academic performance, the kids that had a fixed mindset that believed that uh, the challenge, uh, uh, believed that intelligence was a trait. When they encountered difficulty, they just shut down. They stopped trying because it was um, very uh, defeating for them because they just felt like they weren't smart. But the kids who had a growth mindset, meaning that they just needed, they believed they just needed to work at it because intelligence was a set of skills, not a trait. They worked at it because they knew they could uh, and they got better. But Dr. Dweck and colleagues has also studied this for compassion and empathy. And what her group has found is that people who are aware of the data that you can in fact get better, they will actually work harder at compassion. Um, and so I would say, in addition to your comment, you got to want it. You also have to know that you can in fact get better and you have to have a growth mindset. And, and one of the things that I didn't say and I should have is that I am very much a work in progress myself. <laughs> so, you know, you might think that because uh, Marilyn and Charlie uh, invited me to talk about Compassionomics and, and, I, and I wrote a book about it and I'm doing a lot of research studies about compassion science that I must be the most compassionate doctor. But the truth really um, if I'm being honest, is I'm a work in progress, but the key is that I see it now. I see it and I know I can get better. And so I work at my compassion, just like I work at my, my technical skills in the ICU, just like I work at the, the procedures that I do um, uh, in caring for ICU patients. I'm, I, I'm looking to get better every day. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, yeah. Charlie. Yeah, th thank you, Steve. Uh, we're all a work in progress. It's a journey and we're all on that journey, hopefully. Uh, because we know how important it is. I'd like to move over to one of the questions that I think uh, is, um, is very pertinent. How is compassion incorporated into physician training uh, where you are, Stephen, and where you see it is in general in the mm -hmm. medical, medical field? So one of the things uh, that um, is, in, we published a meta-analysis, my group, um, now a couple of years ago, uh, a systematic review, I should say. And it was on curricula uh, for empathy and compassion training for um, medical folks and found that 75% of these trainings, although they were very heterogeneous curricula, um, they moved the 75% of them moved the needle in a measurable way on empathy or compassion for uh, on by physicians or physicians in training. And so the training works. What we're doing right now, and, and I'm not an expert in curriculum development at the medical school. I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine at Cooper Medical School. Uh, but my colleagues who are um, experts in uh, curricular development are working on that now and collaborating with different groups to, to find the best way uh, uh, to uh, train this, uh, to train young physicians uh, in compassionate behaviors. But importantly, it also, sort of starts at the top, so to speak. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, so I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine. It's the largest uh, department uh, in our medical school or any medical school for that matter, typically. Uh, and my co-author and, and it, Anthony Mazzarelli is a physician, but he's also the co-president CEO of the organization. And so we try to walk the walk, so to speak, and, um, and, but also a, as this is rolled out, the message is rolled out to uh, people throughout our organization, compassion has actually become one of the core values of Cooper. So it's compassion, inclusion, and excellence. And so when we make decision now as leaders, when we're in the in, 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 in the rooms making the tough decisions, we ask ourselves routinely, how does this relate to our core values? How does this relate to compassion, not just for patients, but for each other? And so at the organizational level, I think it's important uh, to, uh, to put compassion front and center as a core value, because I think it, it's a great reminder as you're going through your, your tough decisions, but then also at the student level, 
uh, we do need to teach this and my colleagues right now are still, they're still in the process of working out what, what sort of curriculum they want to use. Okay, thank you, Steve. I would just, I don't know if you're uh, aware, but the Charter for Compassion has embraced a comprehensive education training program called Compassion Integrity Training out of Life University. There are several comprehensive programs, one out of Stanford, see a Compassion uh, Cultivation Training, and mm -hmm. out of Emory University, Compassion or Cognitive-Based Compassion Training. Uh, the Charter has embraced uh, CIT, and um, it, 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 it is one that, um, that I found is pretty powerful in fact, um, at UT Southwestern Medical Center, we're, we are now looking at establishing an elective course for, um, for uh, sophomore students later in their training year, and also MS4 or senior medical students with the CIT curriculum. Uh, so we're hopeful in that regard here locally, but from a national perspective and from across the board, I think the question of, of, of the medical system and and how do we move forward with this with this journey in a way that really does impact the medical care in general within within the country. So uh, and Charlie, just to your to your that? point, and I know you you Please. made a you made a comment um, mm -hmm. in my introduction, uh, joking mm -hmm. of course about the rivalry between Navy and Notre Dame, <laughs> but <Yeah>. um, <laughs> at the University of Notre Dame, uh, Dr. Dominic Vachon and colleagues have actually created a minor uh, uh, in compassionate care and medicine. Uh, and he's written a book about how do it's called how doctors care. And it's all the, the uh, he's, he's a psychologist by background, but it's all the science behind that. But so even at the undergraduate level, like we've been talking about medical students, but now even at the undergraduate level, um, uh, at least one university uh, at at least one university, you can get a minor uh, in the science of compassion. So I think that's a very encouraging sign uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, one of the questions to ask is, can you share some things the medical industry is doing to create a new narrative uh, that will act as medicine? So the burnout in the system uh, that has grown perhaps beyond its capacity for its own applicable where, uh, where, uh, wellness. Uh, do you see this sort of change happening? Uh, I think we've touched on that question already, but um, as, uh, as this individual said but from but Mr. Mr. Fuller, uh, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's an interesting question. Uh, how should we, perhaps in medicine, change the narrative and, and do something that's really transformative uh, to the healthcare arena? Any thoughts about that? It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I, what I will say is... Um... For those of you who are not in healthcare, which is probably the vast majority, um, there are actually two different crises going on right now. The first one is the COVID pandemic. The second one is a critical workforce shortage. Now that is not just my hospital, uh, or I mean, it is across the U.S. I can't I, I can't speak for beyond the U.S. for those of uh, for the, um, the international participants that we have, but this has actually been coming for quite a long time because there were workforce projections showing that we didn't. And specifically, I'm not talking about doctors. I'm talking about nurses and uh, skilled uh, technicians uh, that take care of patients. And this has been brewing for a long time now. And the COVID pandemic has just accelerated it. So we're graduating fewer nurses. Uh, the US population is getting older and there are more complex care needs in uh, the society because now we can keep people alive for longer. So there are much more, there are older, much more complex um, illness uh, patients out there to take care of. So that's been going on for quite a long time. The nursing, uh, graduating fewer nurses um, and not enough to meet the demands, but then also many of the most experienced nurses and those that were most experienced and even like teachers uh, to junior nurses coming up through, through training uh, retired, uh, quite frankly, because of the COVID pandemic. And so there is 
a shortage right now. And um, the reason why I tell you that is that people are really uh, stretched right now in U.S. healthcare, but it's not only because of the pandemic that we're going through. There's another uh, epidemic, uh, if you will, uh, as it relates to a shortage, a, a work for, critical workforce shortages, and it's it's all across the U.S. And so, um, one of the uh, to the question now, I think I believe that if healthcare providers recognize that what is protective against burnout is the human connection. They will, they will prioritize that more in their daily work uh, and be very uh, intentional about it, have better relationships. And the research, this isn't me, this isn't my opinion, this isn't my belief uh, the, um, or any of that. It's just what we found going through the, the evidence and the scientific literature is that compassion can be a powerful beneficial therapy for the giver too in a protective way to build resilience and reduce burnout. And so, yes, you can be stretched, but you can have a, you can, you can, um, uh, yes, you can be stressed, but you can actually build those relationships that will give you that fulfilling part of uh, medicine and, and healthcare um, that will uh, be protective. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Steve. Another question. Uh, do compa does compassion affect the brain? And if so, which part of the brain? Can you answer that? A couple of questions came in on that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, the available evidence. And so first of all, I did what I didn't do is talk about like what operational definitions we use and things like that. But um, just briefly, empathy is the uh, the way we define it, at least in our research program, is that empathy is the sensing, feeling, detecting, and understanding another person's pain or suffering. Mm -hmm. Whereas compassion goes beyond that and is taking action in some way to alleviate a person's pain or suffering to whatever extent possible. So we like to say, and this was popularized by uh, Dr. Don Berwick at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, he just made the astute observation. I love the simplicity. It's empathy plus action equals compassion. But what neuroscience, these, um, the distinction in terms is actually rooted in neuroscience. Mm. So using an imaging modality called functional MRI. So this is a brain scan that can detect uh, subtle differences in cerebral blood flow. What it does is it shows you what part of the brain is being activated at any given moment in time. And using functional MRI uh, of the brain, uh, researchers have found that when you bear witness to suffering, you have that you have empathy uh, for those with pain and suffering. It actually activates the pain center of your brain, the pain center of your brain. So, the the saying "I feel your pain," well, there's actually neuroscience behind that. But you probably didn't need the neuroscience because you know it experientially that it's really uncomfortable to watch other people. Uh, suffer. However, when our mind, neuro, neuroscientists have also found, again, using functional MRI, that when your mind is focused on compassion, taking action to help someone alleviate their pain or suffering to whatever extent possible, a distinct neural structure is activated. So it's not the pain center of the brain. It's actually a an area of the brain considered to be a reward center, a reward center of the brain. So it's associated with positive affect, positive emotion, and a feeling of affiliation. And so what, I, what, what we believe that the, the, the preponderance of the neuroscience evidence and the brain imaging modalities have shown us is that empathy hurts, but compassion heals. And so um, that direct activation of the reward center of the brain mm. is a big part of why uh, I believe the evidence, the scientific evidence points to um, compassion being uh, protective and building resilience. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> so I'll, ju I'll just stop there, Charlie, but, okay. but uh, you know, that, um, there's, there is a uh, robust neuroscience behind this, but I, I should just finish by saying you knew that experientially as well too, because mm -hmm. everybody knows that it feels good to help people, 
Mm-hmm. And then there are a bunch of neurohormones and things like that associated with that, but direct activation of the reward center of the brain, that mm-hmm. is part of it. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the question. Well, th- thank you, Steve. There's, uh, of course, uh, this next question, this next comment, I think opens up a whole area that we could spend another full hour on, but just uh, maybe a few comments from you with regard to uh, climate change and and how this compassionate um, mindset or training us to be more compassionate can possibly affect. The comment is, this is very exciting research. This is by a physician. I promote uh, the construct of 3D compassion, caring for others, self, and the earth. These three dimensions are interdependent and essential for the whole. As a physician, I would love to explore how we can embrace compassion, caring for others, as well as the earth in medical practice. Um, We need to show and bring our caring in these dimensions to the awareness of our patients. Do you have any comments about that in terms of how we as physicians in the healing, <laughs> in the healing arena can, can hopefully uh, help our patients to see this reality? Um, sure. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, the project that we're working on right now, which will culminate in a new book uh, in May 2022, uh, is really applying all these principles to the general public uh, in the broad sense. And there is um, uh, robust evidence that uh, serving others is actually the best medicine for yourself. Mm-hmm. And, um, and specifically, I think about psychological effects um, and uh, reducing depression, reducing anxiety. And um, there, the evidence points to the fact that anything that gets you out of your own head, so to speak, uh, and just focused on yourself, anytime you're focused on others, uh, there can be powerful beneficial effects for your own mental health. So one example of getting out of your own head would be um, the focusing on the well-being of our planet. Actually, what the research shows, it's most robust when you're focused on some very distinct individual uh, that you can help, whether it's somebody close to you or but somebody you can actually visualize rather than like the world in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think anything that gets you out of your own head uh, is uh, good for your mental health. And, and that's not my opinion. That's actually what the research supports um, and, and the science supports. Mm-hmm. So I think that, uh, uh, I think that uh, climate change is, is obviously the, you know, uh, one of, if not the greatest existential threat that we have mm-hmm. at the present time. So focused on, you know, future generations and other people being other focused uh, is one way to, uh, to embrace that. Yeah, well, you started out with uh, this uh, existential crisis in medical care, and we're just now talking about another ex- existential crisis. We have one. We have uh, probably time for maybe one more uh, question, if you would. And this question is: Do you have any phrases you would recommend to healthcare professionals to use as they enter the room? Um, They say here, I heard that one doctor who says, I have time. Is there anything that I can do for you uh, as a way of uh, entering into that relationship and inviting the the patient to in a compassionate way, in a compassionate, caring way? So do you have any uh, statements you make? Everything I like to uh, um, recommend is evidence based, including this. Here's a question. I I don't have time to tell you about the study It's from University of Colorado. But when you ask your patients this question, what worries you the most? You get something distinctly different than what is written on their chart as their chief complaint. And I've been using this now in my practice. I'll ask you what I'll ask people at the end of a conversation where I think I've answered all the questions. What worries you the most? And then they'll tell me something that I never would have expected. And that's really what's front of mind for them. But they didn't really have that invitation to share it. So what worries you the most? Uh, I I think that's a great, I've used that outside in personal life. I mean, I, I think it's a great question and it's evidence-based. There's research to support it and show it's important. Lastly, um, and I know we just have a couple of minutes. I also practice something that I call the pause. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something about healthcare experiences that uh, are uh, generate intense emotions, but also intense memories. And maybe it's because the amygdala, the part of our brain where we, um, 
experience our intense emotions is right next to the hippocampus where we make our memories. But, mm. but, but, but healthcare experiences stay with people. And just knowing the power of that, um, I was making rounds in the ICU not that long ago with a middle-aged woman whose older brother was dying. He had septic shock, overwhelming infection, organ system shutting down. We were trying everything we possibly could, but it looked like sepsis was going to be too much for him. And it was a very difficult conversation when I had to tell her that he wasn't going to make it through the night. And um, when I was getting up to leave at the end of that very difficult conversation, she said something no one's ever asked me in the ICU before. She said, um, you don't remember me, do you? And I, hmm. I said, uh, no, I'm sorry. She said, I wouldn't expect that you would. You see so many patients here. I, I, I wouldn't expect it, but I, I need you to know that seven years ago, and she pointed to the ICU bed right across the hall on the other side of the hall of the ICU. My mom was in that bed right over there. Mm. and she was dying and there was nothing that could be done to save her. And you were her doctor and you had to tell me that. So we've actually had this conversation before. Mm. Wow. And I was just blown away. Like I, 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 I couldn't breathe. Um, but then she said something I will never forget as long as I practice medicine. Mm. She said, but I need you to know mm. those nurses, those nurses, she used the word kindness, the kindness of those nurses they let me know I wasn't going to be alone. They held my hand through the whole thing. It's so hard for me because I miss my mom so much. And it's so hard. I think about it every day now, e even now, seven years later, it's really hard. But every time I think about that, and it's hard for me, um, what she was describing is that she's revisited by what she called the kindness of those nurses. And then she said this, she said, and it helps me now. It helps me still even now mm -hmm. and and i i thought the kindness of those nurses on just it was a routine shift for them but it echoes and echoes and reverberates and and resounds and and it's something that people will never forget and so what i teach my students as we go in whether it's a difficult conversation like that or anything that's meaningful whether it's good news bad news that we're sharing whatever it is i ask the students like what do you want to be remembered for because for you're going to go home at the end of your shift today and maybe never think about it again, but this may stay with them for months, years, and perhaps forever. So I just pause before I go into a room, recognizing that power. And once you recognize that power, you think differently about how you approach things. But I just, I know we got to go. I, I thank everybody for the opportunity, Charlie, Marilyn, Mimi, everybody. It's been an honor. Well, thank, thank you, Stephen, so much. I mean, so rich uh, and so much uh, to, to, to ponder, to think about, and to, and to uh, incorporate in your own relationship with others. I mean, family as, as others. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn, who I think has a few announcements. But again, Stephen, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we look forward to that May publishing date that you mentioned earlier on your new book. Thank you. Right. Yes, Stephen, I think you left us all uh, out of breath. Um, incredible stories. Um, and I think so very important for us to hear in any profession in which we're involved. I think it, it doesn't matter. I, besides wanting to thank uh, Stephen, I want to remind people that on Wednesday, December 8th, uh, we will have the Dutch journalist, uh, Rutger Bergman, uh, in his New York Times bestseller, Humankind. Uh, I think you'll want to join us for that. And as you can see, it's at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Um, for those who really enjoy the Global Reads, we have on our website all 12 Global Reads listed for 2022. So you only see six of them here, but I invite you to go visit the page so that you can see the other six. And um, we are looking forward to an incredible year next year, just as we have had this year. Um, the other thing that we're introducing in 2022 is a film festival, a Compassion Film Festival with um, a film each month that will be uh, hosted by our individual 12 sectors of the Charter for Compassion. <laughs> and then we have a course that starts November 15th 
Um, and I hope that all of you who are interested in um, current issues will consider joining us for that particular course. Also, I wanted to mention, and I did put it in the chat, but the Charter Education Institute has a number of self-directed learning courses, one of which is the science of compassion. And um, Stephen is quoted in there, uh, along with many of the leading forces uh, that are out there dealing with the science of compassion. And the last thing is we want to invite you to our big gala. Um, and it is a virtual gala so that you'll, you won't have to do any traveling, but I think the big traveling that you'll be doing will be to uh, meet new people, uh, experience extraordinary acts of compassion around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll hear from everyone from Karen Armstrong, one of the founders of the Charter of Compassion, the Dalai Lama, and for some people who um, recognize others here, uh, Reverend Jennifer Bailey uh, will be giving out the award to Krista Tippett for her great work in the humanities, uh, Vendanta Shiva, who is outstanding in the field of climate control and um, agriculture will be one of the recipients of our award. So we're looking forward to you joining us for that. And thank you again uh, to Stephen Tresniak and to Charlie for being a great facilitator for this compassionate uh, read in the Global Read series. Thank you all and hopefully we'll see you next month, but before that at the gala. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all.